Okay, hello everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about the Educate computer. This particular machine, on the desk there in front of you, is based on the original design which was published in uh, August 1974, so it's 50 years old. Uh, obviously that machine is not 50 years old, it's just barely a few months old, but it's a very close replica to that original machine. And there was a series of articles published over about 12 months which had the computer, various peripherals, uh, programming, and really it was the start of home computer in Australia. It was the first. In fact, as you'll see, so in the beginning, 1974, the first article was published, it just got picked at the post by a design for a similar book, a computer called the Mark 8 in the Radio Electronics magazine, the American magazine. And there's some differences. Educate, this one here was based on Tutor Logic, so it's a discrete machine, lots of chips. Uh, the Mark 8 used an Intel 8008 microprocessor. They both had a similar amount of memory and uh, similar characteristics, but there the, 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 uh, they diverge quite a lot. Anyone's interested, I've got information on both. There's a copy of the Radio Electronics Magazine for the Mark 8 and the handbook which is the compilation of the Educate series as well. So, yeah, that's, that's all so that, that's the beginning. And it was a real shame that Electronics Australia didn't get in first, but that's the way it goes. It's worth thinking about it. We've come a long way. One estimate to build the Educate in 1974 was about $300 at the time. So if you do the conversion, that's nearly $3,000 it was an expensive machine. Uh, an 8008 chip, the chip alone cost 120 US dollars at the time. So, well, I've taken into account the exchange right there, but $1,100 for the microprocessor chip. Any wonder Jim Rowe didn't want to go down that path. He, he makes note of that in his open comments in his magazine in the, in the article. So he could have done that, but the prospect of blowing up a very expensive chip was a bit too daunting. Uh, both machines use what were quite new static RAM chips at the time. At the time, they were three dollars each, so about thirty dollars. Is that per bit? Sorry. Is that one one chip per bit? Uh, well, in the Mark Eight, yes, but in the in the um, Educate Mark, I'm going to explain why that is the case. So the in fact, I've got it wrong. No, it's what chip. Two one. Yeah, so it should have been actually eight rather than two. In that, in that one. Sorry, that's my mistake. So they were expensive kits, expensive projects, and I was originally interested as a almost working school, late late high school, but I couldn't get the money together and other things happened. So the educate as it stands is an eight bit machine, serial architecture, which is quite new compared to our parallel machines of today, <laughs> lightning fast speed of 500 kilohertz. This one runs about twice that, with overclock. <laughs> it has five registers, so there's a program card, an accumulator, memory verse register, memory buffer register, and an instruction register. In fact, there's a sixth register as well, which is the front panel switches, which is a register you can use to read, to upload addresses in memory, um, and, and to that. It has three input output instructions uh, and two input output channels, so four on their channels altogether. Uh, there's six memory instruction, memory reference instructions and eight operating instructions. They may not seem much, but when you see how they combine, there's actually quite a lot more than that. So in terms of general construction, there's six circuit boards. The top one is the timing board. So each of the boards has specific functions as a timing board, there's the accumulator, there's a program card, and an IO board, a uh, memory board, and they plug into this motherboard. And then there's a the front panel which has the indicator LEDs and switches. So the front panel indicators are useful for showing what the machine is doing. It's uh, hopefully still running, it's just running a little test program here to the accumulator. The machine is basically functional. And the switches, the switches here, you can either set the address or load data into an address. 
Uh, you can examine, load and examine memory. You can start and stop at single step at various other things. It's quite versatile in that, in that way. Originally, the original zone used all 74 series TTL. So it was quite current hungry. The original version for about 3 amps at 5 volts. The recent versions, the two versions that I've built, have used a mixture of 74 LS and 74 HC uh, chips. Same chips, just different um, generation. And so the current consumption is about 200 milliamps, so it's, it's quite a less current. So it runs cool and <coughs> it works. The, the original design used single sided boards with lots of links on the top. This one, the modern version, uses other side of plate through uh, holes, which makes life very much easier. Any questions so far? Okay, so, as I said, there's nearly 100 chips in there. What's interesting about it, as I indicated, it's a serial architecture, so all the operations are one bit at a time, and it's four separate buses, which the vertical lines the A, B, C, D bus, they transfer the data on bit at a time to the various places required, such as the serial adder, the accumulator, the memory buffer, all of that, all done one bit at a time, which was the way very early computers worked, simply because hardware was so expensive. And parallel buses are certainly much faster. But you know, this, this has sort of the simplicity on the side. Well, and the players that built this lab. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is like, this is still how I know what we're going on. Okay. That's interesting to know. Um, and there were some commercial machines made that operated serial. So, as I said, there's a limited number of instructions, but they can be combined in different ways. And so, we've got some memory and reference instructions, so you can hand between a memory location and the accumulator. You can do a two scrum and add, you can increment shift, you can load the memory address, you can deposit to a memory address, subroutines, uh, conditional, uh, unconditional jumps. Then there's a whole lot of other things you can do with the accumulator, which is really useful, shift and left, shift and right, uh, and clear, complement, uh, and various other conditional jumps. So skip on the minus accumulator or skip on the zero accumulator. All really useful instructions. Then there's some ones that actually combine micro instructions, again quite useful. And then even though you've only got a few IO channels and a few basic commands, there's enough there to write to a memory, to write to an IO channel, read from an IO channel, and set and reset the flags, which are really useful for when you transfer data between the computer and the IO device or even the computer. And a couple of interesting features about the design. Each instruction has fits and eight bits. And so addressing is limited. It's 256 bytes of memory. And within that, there's 16 pages of 16 bytes. And you can do a direct jump, and I'll explain some of this later, not in more detail, anywhere within a page. Uh, and indirect addressing allows you to go to anywhere in memory. And I'll, I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Is that in Optimal? That's in Optimal. Yeah, that was a bit of a learning curve for me because I was always used to work with PEX. So, thinking of it. so, what was the design philosophy? So, it was designed by Jim Rowe, who was a long time staff member of uh, Electronics Australia. He started off when it was radio television in Hollywood, you don't know, in the early 60s. And he's only retired quite recently, so it was a very long career in um, technical journalism. So he, I think he's he announced his, re his retirement in Silicon Chip just a month or two back. So he's, he's been around in the business for a very long time. He's done some really lovely design work. So his design philosophy here, the machine was designed as an educational machine with a view, and he states this in, in the preface to his um, article, getting people into employment, into, into computing. Because there wasn't a lot of the way of training, certainly there was no 
affordable computers at the time that people could have and play with at home. So he, he built, designed and built this thing as a, as a way for people to be trained and view to get jobs. So for these, he assembled using available and relatively inexpensive components. Even TTL chips at the time were expensive. Interestingly, it's a scaled out version of a digital equipment PDP-8, which was one of the most popular computers at the time. In fact, it was the first of the so-called affordable mini computers. Affordable at the time was like seven or eight thousand dollars, they were still expensive. Uh, but you'll see that there's a similar sort of layout, and you had lead switches. And that's a PDP-8S, which is also a serial machine, so it's one of the few commercial serial machines that were made. And when Jim did the design, he set it up so that the instructions in the computer of the educator are the same mnemonic and very similar coding as the PDP-8. So if somebody looks at the assembly code uh, for the educator and they know PDP-8 assembly language, they'd be able to follow it. It's very straightforward. Any questions? Well, how much does the PDP-8 cost? Uh, it varies because they were in production for quite a long time. There were several different versions. But at least um, they, were, they were really happy when they got it down to 10,000 US dollars. Yeah, big thousands. <laughs> and it was a lot of money. That was 10,000 US dollars at the time. Yeah. And so they were still an expensive machine. So you've got to start $10,000 now. So, so as a training machine, it's fantastic. Yeah. It has the same instruction set. Yep. So, what are the limitations? It has <coughs> 256 bytes of RAM. That's all. But that's not as limited as you might think. It's a limited instruction set. But as I've discovered, it's quite flexible. You can do practically anything with it. It's relatively slow, being a serial machine, one bit at a time. So, each instruction cycle takes about 90 microseconds. This one's a bit faster because we speed it. It's about half that because it's running. Uh, twice the original clock speed, more or less. There's no commercial software or technical support. Of course not. It's completely on your own. But the biggest hardware limitation in my mind is the lack of a link, what's called a link register, or the ability to carry, carry bit forward for multi bit operations. So if you want to do 16 bit maths or, or multi, high precision mathematics, side for eight bits. It's complicated. You can get around it, but the workarounds take up memory. You know what the point is. So that's, I think, probably the biggest limitation rather than the device. That's still clean for repeat control and we'll schedule it. Yeah. No problem. In fact, that was one of his, one of his app proposed applications for it. Mm. So why do you build one in 2024? Yeah. Basically, you're going to raspberry Pi what was the possibility of that, what more capable. Well, as a historical context, I always wanted to do it. Opportunity came, so a bit of nostalgia. But it's nice to make something different and interesting, certainly challenging, uh, to get it going. And if it doesn't work, I can fix it. <laughs> and get in there with a the and soldering line and, and change it to my heart's content. And you can explore ideas, and there's a few ideas, famous including multi-processor versions. I've had two of them coupled together. I saw a very rudimentary network. Um, why? Because it's fun, because I can. So it's it's the technical challenge, I think, of, of, of uh, building. And there's a few people who are, who are building it for that same reason. So that, that's why you build one. Did you make your own boards? No. The first one I built, I built two. I used Veriboard. It was hand-wired. Uh, this one, uh, Chapman City Board Suda has had professional made double sided boards made. So these are double sided flat through boards. They're very nice boards. But they're very close to the original design and layout. Uh, so having a double sided board certainly makes life very much easier. You know who made them? Um, they're made out of seeds or from scratch? Uh, no, they're made out of seeds. The set cost about 200 boards. Yeah. Okay. So. How do we get here? So I first started on the first version in late 2022. I thought the first thing, how I, how I decided to do it was I came across um, a website which had 
schematic so I can understand. I'll draw it in the current um, format with the schematics in that which I'm strictly or logically correct are hard to follow. Whereas the redrawn ones are easy to follow. And so I built the first version on variable, and I had it working by 2023. We'll never do that again. It was kind of a variable cutting your eyes and things. But it did work. And uh, it's a bit of a monster, but it works fine. Um, I then got in touch with um, Peter Sydney, who I've served in particular, and he uh, got me a set of boards. I hit that, and I had it working late last year. Dan, how much time did you spend building the airport? Cool. Yeah. Like, just mm -hmm. give me some money. Days? Weeks? Oh, months. <laughs> and how, did it work first go or did you have to debug it? It worked first go. Well, that was lucky. Yeah, if it didn't work first go, <laughs> I thought to myself, no, if this doesn't work first go, I'll never get it working. Um, but it did work, it still works. And uh, this one's got an intermittent, I was pleased that it works tomorrow. But um, I ended up getting close to it because it, I think it probably done a chip that's flaky. Anyway, it's working with the knife. Uh, I did realise, however, that to do anything really useful with it, you have to have something more than the flicking switches on the front now. First of all, you've got to convert everything into an into octal. You've got to get, you've got to key it in right and then do it all. It's just debugging it through the front panel. It's possible, but it's really tedious and very little problem. So I wrote an assembler, and I thought, hmm, it's nice to have a simulator, so I don't have to do the motion machine. So I wrote a simulator and downloader, so I can do everything on the PC and downloader. Um, and explain to someone who what the simple simulator is. Okay, um, so who knows what assembly language is? Who doesn't know what assembly language is? Okay. So you've got a computer audience. <laughs> okay. Right. So you write your machine. Um, I can call up. How does the downloader work? Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. Oh, okay, we're getting it. I want to share the screen. Okay, I can't do it easily. I won't break something. That worked just before. I'm not sure why I can't share the screen. Well, anyway, assembly language is you put those various op codes together. So if we go back. Here, so you've got the op codes. So say you want to, to um, clear, the, clear the accumulator, um, load something from a memory address, and put it to output. So you'd have to write down uh, in your assembly code CRA, uh, then you might go tab, then memory location, and then LBS uh, load output buffer. And there's your three instructions to take a memory location and spin it out to a serial port, or an output port, it doesn't have to be serial. And so the assembly language is just a list of memories of um, opcodes. And you have to get them just right. You can have absolutely perfectly correct from the syntax point of view, and it won't run. Does it have a V load? No. No, it doesn't. <laughs> All right. We can't even get those pieces. So if you want three, you uh, start with zero and go add ink, ink, ink. No, you can actually load. You can have a. You can fry, You can have a memory location. I have one. It lets you load in right on the switches. Uh, yeah. Or, or you can do. It. Um, I, I actually that So the assembler takes the machine code or your higher level, slightly higher level language and turns it into optal code and then downloads it through um, what was set up is basically in parallel to the switch registers. So Jim designed it with a uh, Connect on the back, which is in parallel with shift registers, and you just use open corrector transistors or, or uh, something to 
pull the lines here and get them up. We did that originally with the view of using a paper tape reader, an 8 bit paper tape reader. So, in fact, my, this, this here more or less emulates a paper tape reader. It runs about the same speed, it should run much faster, but I've set it about 10 characters a second. So, that, that takes the, the optal code from the, the assembler and downloads it through the switch register. Just like you would in the original machine using a paper tape reader. I've done the paper tape reader, getting one's impossible, at least the price that I can afford. What the simulator does is allows, allows you to simulate the complete operation of the machine on a PC. And that's handy because if I don't have a machine, I can still do the debugging with code from the way or whatever to feel like it. I can actually develop the code on my laptop and get it working and then come home and download it and it will work. So they certainly speed up the problem. You don't have to do it that way, but it certainly helps. And it was, it was an interesting exercise to me that I've never written in a similar or a similar way before, and it was an interesting exercise in understanding our programs and more important how computers work. So I could say, learned a great deal and had fun doing it, which was really the object of the design, I suppose. So we're talking about programming the machine. So each instruction is eight bits wide. Only a single byte. So that's a big difference between this machine, say, and the Mark 8, the, 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 and most of the microprocessors since. Instructions in most um, modern machines can have one, two, or three or more bytes, which give you much more capability. One byte is all we've got in this machine. The top three bits are the opcode, generally. And for memory reference instructions, the following five bits are or for, the following bits. One bit is a flag to say that it's directly in there to address them. Then four bits are for memory. So remember I said the 16 byte pages? That's where that comes from. There's four bits that is used to designate the, the address within each page. Second. Some other, other instructions, other instructions is all the bits one by one. The IO instructions are some of the micro, uh, the combined instructions use the bits as well. And I'll go into, I'll explain this here. The indirect addressing allows you to access any byte in memory rather than just this, this one byte within the system. I was saying, you're saying it didn't have to, it didn't have to be not to have to do a page, a page sort of first. Yeah. yeah, so this is how it works. So indirect addressing is, is common in micro microcontrollers. So let's look at the direct instruction. So you just have a, a um, jump, an unconditional jump, to a memory location here. And this has to be the same memory location, in the same 16 byte page. So you say jump, and it jumps to there and continues addressing. As long as that is in the 16, somewhere within the 16 byte page, it's fine. If you don't, if you try and jump somewhere else in the page, you know that doesn't work. The indirect addressing is a bit different. And then you have a memory location in the same page, which contains the address somewhere else. And that address can be an 8-bit value, so any one of the 256 bytes. So the indirect addressing says, OK, I'll use that address to jump to. So it uses, in fact, two complete machine cycles to do the jump rather than just a single machine cycle. But it does give you access to any part of the 256 bytes of memory. And that's very similar to the PDP-8. It had a 127 page, 127 byte page, but it could have up to, I think, 4K of memory. So that's how they got around the limitation. Of um, having a single byte instruction. And it, it's quite efficient, it just, it's just a bit slow, that's all. So when you're coding, first thing you'll know is never waste a byte. You've only got 256. So every byte that is possible has to be used. You can only use direct jumps within the current 16 page uh, range, sorry, 16 byte page. So try and keep the code module as far as possible. And it's just surprising how well that works. The, 
even though there's a limited range of opcodes and they seem to be simple, they're, they're really clever and thought, thought out. And was, was it modular two that the jumps would go like plus an eight minus, yeah, plus seven minus eight or something? No, no, it's just a direct address, so it's not a oh, okay, yeah, right. not limited address. And so, as I say, the, the opcodes, the design of the opcodes is really clever. And um, hats off to the, the Jimro and the, the, the PDP8 designers in depth because they're very cleverly contrived the opcodes. There's no stack in this machine, so you can't push values onto a stack. The stacks are typically used for subroutines after pushing on the return fix. There's no stack. So, the way that's handled in, in this machine and the PDP8 is that the first address location of a, a subroutine, in fact, is where the return code is stored. And when you exit the subroutine, you jump, do an indirect jump through there. Works fine, but it's quite different to any other program you've ever done where you usually say things like stacks. It's actually how MBS mainframes used to work. Okay, fair enough. Um, and as I indicated before, there's no easy way of implementing a carry out or carry in for signing up decision uh, operations. So if you want to do 16 bit maths, it's complicated. It can be solved in various ways. I've done using 4 bit uh, operations, and that works fine, but it chews up a lot of memory. Or you can do it <laughs> another way um, using lots of uh, 16 bit increments, because you can actually do an increment and skip instruction on each. You can increment an uh, 8 bit and, and, and byte, and when it gets to zero, you can skip the next instruction, and so that could be um, to do a high bit, the high bit, rather. So you can actually do multi precision maths. Fairly straightforward when you're done, but it's quite slow. It sends the overflow, you can detect the overflow. Yep. Right. But it's slow. But it works. So, Applications and programs today. I was challenged to write a game for it, <laughs> so I did. Uh, I wrote Conway's Game of Life and I use Life for the Oceans. And that's a very strange game the computer plays itself. When you play, it's a one player game. And it's interesting because it's you might the term cellular, cellular automata. And it's, it's a it's a program which tends to evolve and change, and you can set up a display, and you can see there's amazing patterns. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a very popular game when it first came out because people found it interesting, and because you could, the computer just sort of seemed to have a life of its own. Some strict rules, strict but simple rules for it to work, and it's my life's a similar variation. And Conway's game of life is still subject to research, would you believe? Quite a lot of up to date information. People are using huge machines and implementations on um, doing interesting things because it's, it's been shown to, to develop uh, interesting characteristics in, in the field of bits is um, big enough. In this case, it has 128 bits, so each bit is a cell, and that cell can be alive or dead, and the various rules decide to recognize all the bits. You can find the question there. It's quite interesting. Uh, Fibonacci sequence generator just uh, adds numbers together with a certain sequence. But it's a good test of logic and um, arithmetic. So 16 bit Fibonacci sequence generator, which I'll demonstrate. Um, to excuse the French here, but brain fuck is a, a high level interpreter, sort of high level anyway, and it allows you to write code. In a, in a way that abstracts away the, the details of the machine. And in theory, you can write any program using your own fuckers. It's, uh, again, there's plenty of information to read about it. It's complicated to use, that's for sure. And, but implementation took, well, about 200 bytes, and it's full compiler. <laughs> and you can do. You can do Pretty much anything you want it to do, but it, it'll take a long time to do it. So, you haven't reported Wolfenstein to it yet? <laughs> no, it won't play Doom. Well, I suppose it could play Doom too. <laughs> but it's just taking a very long time. 
So right flux is supposed to be true and complete, which basically means you can do anything if you've got enough time. Um, it's a lot of <laughs> So, and then of course there's lots of test and debugging code. We have to write code to test every single lot of code and make sure it's doing the exact test and all, et cetera. And there's plans for other people to explore some multi process applications. One way to get around the implementation is the multiple machines and some sort of thing. Some of these exist out there by the developers and some of yours, are they in that list? Uh, or you wrote them all? Conway's game, no, no this, for this machine, I've written those ones. Um, the Conway's game a lot exists on the PCs and all sorts of things. It's, it's been around since I think the late 70s. But I've got the invitation on doing that. Uh, Fibonacci sequence is probably the first year computer program. Next slide. is just taking a photo of all the source code. That we <laughs> so, the computer itself is probably not very much useful. So, Jim and I, over, over a period of the year, decide to design various peripheral devices. So, there's a serial uh, IO um, devices in the UART. So, there's one over here. Uh, Was it a discrete UART? Yep. Uh, the cool. It's an AY 5301 or something like that. So you, have to, you can still get them. It's the same as a 6402, isn't it? A Paris 6402. Oh, yes, and it was actually uh, a UR chip, not a discrete. Oh, no, it's a UR chip, the 40 point device. Probably 5313. 5313, might be that, yes. A line printer, so you had this really nice little Philips line printer, which, uh, which must have been quite expensive at the time. Uh, I bought a little point of sale a thermal printer for $30. <laughs> Isn't that? Um, the Philips devices, well, again, if you can find one, they'd be hugely expensive, I'm sure. A uh, music player, which was built around top octave synthesizer from an electronic organ, so that's this device here. I hope I can demonstrate that. That was quite neat. So, a paper tape punch and reader, which I've sort of emulated. Uh, a data storage system is a cassette tape and uh, an FSK mode effectively. And he also proposed some ideas for expansion of both memory and I.O. I told you before, there's four, two inputs and two output ports. Um, for most for lots of applications, that's fine. But Jim Rowe proposed a device designed for, in essence, a 16 minute multiplexer. And a way to actually have external memory, a bit like secondary storage. And I built one based on those sort of rough ideas, and certainly not published as a full idea. And I've got that working at home on the other machine, and that gives me 64k of RAM, plus a whole stack more I/O. So that's a lot more, uh, gives you a lot more capability. Uh, it slows things down because you've got to do lots of multiplexing to switch things, but it works. So, recent developments. A complete set of double solid boards are available. You can download the, the um, keycap files and get them made. Uh, if you speak very, very nicely, you might be able to send you a set. There's been about 30 sets of PC boards shipped globally, which is interesting. A few people around the place have got them going. Uh, so I know of probably uh, one, two, three, four machines aside from mine that are working. Aside from the assemblers and simulators that I've written, there uh, is another much older assembler that was written by Chuck in Adelaide and a simulator written more recently, which basically looks like the machine. It's a Windows based simulator that actually presents the machine with the switches and controls the switches and all that and how. Uh, I found it very frustrating to use, so I made that, which is much better. Um, expansion of RAM, we put out the capabilities. Another way of expanding RAM, which I didn't talk about, is basically bank switching, so having parallel RAM in addition to the RAM chips that are all in there and devoting one or another port from one output port to actually switching a second or more banks of RAM in place of the existing bank RAM. That would be good, that would be very much faster, uh, but it would be challenging to program. You should have to at least keep some, you wouldn't have to switch all of the memory at a time, because otherwise you 
basically, I can't see how you can actually switch memory without having a piece of memory that switched. So you have to have something that you just swap stuff around. And there's an active Facebook. So in July, was it the June? There was the Retro Computer Fair at uh, Radford College, the Australian Computer Museum Society. They had all sorts of wonderful hardware. It's an amazing, an amazing show. And um, I hadn't planned to be there, but people from Sydney wanted to demonstrate their yeah, this system. Well, I don't like that COVID, so I was asked to step in, so I spent the day there. It was a good day, it was good fun. It was interesting to see all the hardware and it's uh, quite a people have an amazing collection of computing hardware <laughs> lurking around in the garages, that's for sure. There's a whole lot of references if you search for the web. You can still get the magazine articles from Silicon Ship or the handbook, and there's a Wikipedia page, of course, and then People are interested in that to circulate those links. There is there is some information in there, but just enough to get you started. And so let's have a little demonstration of how it works. So at the moment it's just running a short test program. Uh, all it's doing is incrementing the the, the accumulator. So the bottom the bottom row of lights is the 8-bit accumulator, and it's just counting up and for lighting. So if I stop that. What was that switch then? That yeah. was the stop switch, the halt switch. <laughs> but the interesting thing about it, so I tell it to run it. It'll just, it's a completely static machine. You mm -hmm. stop the clock, it'll just stop exactly where it is. So you halt it, and you can restart it. It's just fantastic that way. So you don't have to reboot it. By the way, there's no operating system. It's bare metal program. You've got to, whatever you put into it, you just run. Okay, let's see if we can make some music. So the fully synchronous machine, there's no synchronous parts in it? Sorry? Is it a fully synchronous machine? There's no asynchronous parts in the logging? Uh, oh, there's no asynchronous logging. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, that's limiting. That limits the speed which you can run as glitches. So I'm just going to download a new program and we'll see the lights change. That should go. So this will download the program into memory eventually. There we go. So that's about the speed of paper tape. So I made it about the speed of paper tape, about 10 bits, 10 characters a second. 10 bytes a second. 10 yeah. bytes a second, yeah. Okay, and I just hit run. It was faster than switches. <laughs> This happened before. This one worked a little bit. I'm not sure whether this is intermittent or what. Or where's the way? So is that the red screen of death? Sorry? Is that the, the red screen, screen of death, death? yes. Well, I tested it all before it came, of course, but then it's bounced around in the car. Did the same thing at the computer fair, which is really, at the computer show, which is really annoying. Just about it. That wobbling told me something's wrong somewhere. So that was 150 bytes of memory, including the chip. So the, the actual instructions to run it, there's probably 10 instructions to, to um, read the memory location, output it to, to the um, output of the serial port, and then each 
So what four bits decide the note, then there's another two bits which decide the octave, and then another two bits which decide the timing. So you can have four note lengths uh, in any any one of the any one of the notes, tempered octave, uh, tempered notes within four octaves. So it's um, the same chip that there is in a in old style um, electronic organs. <laughs> Getting a chip was interesting. You can get original ones, but you don't know whether they're any good. Because there's a company in England who actually makes uh, reproductions using FPGAs in a 16 bit package. And so it's identical, it's plugged in and it works just like the original one. For this, for about $70, uh, including postage. So that's, that's why the original chip is not possible. So why is that one note scratching? Um, I think it's something to do with the uh, that, that bug I've been chasing around the I/O because normally it, it shouldn't be, and it could be because of it doesn't like running at the faster speed. So it's, like, it's, as I said, it's running about twice what it was. Are you, you, are you both yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's running? Yeah, it's running about a megahertz instead of five hundred megahertz. Yeah, it's overclocking. Does it need any soon? Ah, oh, there's a lid on this. <laughs> uh, probably not playing that sound. Probably not. Um, the Fibonacci sequence is just as added, basically adds numbers together, and I'll just load that in. Because that will demonstrate the little printer as well. I'll give you a CT plan in the book. <laughs> if you want. Text and tag. The nine seventy four. That was worth being like you thought. You know, talk to you. It's so amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here we go. This program is much longer. This one uses up nearly all the memory. Because it has to do a whole lot of um, complicated mathematics. Oh, so is it pre-computing or is it doing it on the fly? It's doing it on the fly. Right. So it's printing out the sum of sequential, sequential numbers. You notice it's starting to get slowed, slowing down because I've used the, the very slow way of doing the mathematics simply because I could, it was the only way I could actually easily, in the space I had available, could implement the 16 bit maths. But it does work. Um, it's printing out the value in hexadecimal, which is probably not very helpful. But I have a version. So there you go. So the first, so it's. Yeah, uh, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, etc. So that's the Fibonacci sequence. And it goes all the way up to a really big number, um, 012, 012, in hex. So that's um, 90,000 or something. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's the thing with the printer is an 8-bit. Now, like, hey, it's parallel load on the printer, is it from the No, it's, it's, um, it's just a TTL serial. Oh, okay. No. So that works, and I've got now a version that actually prints it out in decimal. But it takes two machines to do it. So <laughs> this machine does the calculation and then sends it to the other machine, which converts the, the hex to a decimal and then sends it back. It's all a bit bizarre, but it, it does work. Um, I won't demonstrate game of life. No, I won't do this for you. If you look it up, you can see how it works. It's an interesting sort of single user game. So, yeah. So, uh, that was just toggling a bit straight off the I.O. Was it as, as serial data for the printer? No, it sends it out through the UI. OK, yeah, right. You got it. So, well, first of all, acknowledgements. 58, 50 years, I think it's Jim Rose. Uh, Career spans all of my career in technology, and many of you as well. <laughs> and he, I'm sure, was an influence on many people in the technical sphere. Electronics Australia magazine and uh, Silicon Chip have been, I think, important in educating both professionals and uh, non professionals in electronics and technology. So, 
he certainly played his part in that. Of course, when he did it a couple of times. And I'm sure you never imagined that people would still use the US machine 50 years after the computer, so considering the computing power that we have available otherwise, why would you bother? And it's like an early college uh, born suit because he he uh, he did a lot of work in redrawing schematics and doing the boards, and he's been quite an inspiration in terms of other ideas, and so he deserves some acknowledgement as well. So in conclusion, I think the educated computer is historically significant. The first machine described in Australia for home construction was computer, and very close to the first in the world, missed out by a number of weeks. It's a rare example of, of a computer, complete computer design that can be built by anyone. It had a number of innovative peripheral devices. So there's the, there was, well, I didn't show you several, but I'll show you this. For testing and getting the thing going. An optical display and a keypad. My keypad doesn't look anything like his, but um, it, it sort of, sort of works. So Educate, I think, was really the start, in many respects, the rapid growth of personal computing, allowed people to get their hands dirty, so to speak. And after that, we had you know, S100, we had Dream 68 machines, we had all sorts of you know, machines published in uh, Electronic Australia, and Computer Journal, and other Electronic Journals. It really was rapid growth in home computing. And it's led to what we have now. So. I think it's, I think it's a, an important piece of history, it's certainly recognised by the Computer Museum Society as that, and uh, other computer museums around the world as well. Okay, thanks for listening. Any questions? Does it scamp that follow this? SEMP? It could have been. Could well have been. And then 3650 and then Dream? Yeah. 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 So, okay. No, that's fantastic. I really, really like it. Um, okay. Inspired my enthusiasm to do some more one bit processes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are other one bit designs. <coughs> oh, I, I just sort of considered maybe using a, an instruction set from a complex processor. But, if, but when, I, when I need complex things done, but not fast, mm. implement them as a one bit machine. Mm. So, yeah, if you really stuck with the hardware. Yep, sure. Well, there you go, there's one way of doing it. You shouldn't see how many of those machines you've implemented in a nice 40 year PGA. <laughs> how many of them do you get? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, tens of thousands of them. Yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps good. I wonder how small the machine would be if you put it in a volume process and not use it. So what's that? I wonder how small the uh, chip would be if you put this in a volume process and not use it. Would it put it like this? in number of square millimeters. Yeah, it wouldn't be but probably not much. Really. It's the 100 TDL chips. It's probably only a few thousand devices. So yes, it could be quite small. You'd actually be able to work out a transistor count, wouldn't you? Because the transistor count published for each device. Yeah, yeah. There might be 40 or 50 transistors of device on the complex ones. Well, probably more than the range. Maybe two, uh, three, oh, yeah, two What are they? Is it two 102s in that dial? No, one, 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 the price of the chips came down, so it could be the price. So that oh, you've actually got 1101s in there? I've got 1103s in there. Where, where did you get those there? I've got them out of China, I've got them out of China. Where are they doing with them? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, 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 that's right
Um, so we're all saying. Uh, we'll probably didn't rush into the fuckers. <laughs> no, that's not so. That, that, that's actually not so silly. It's, mm. it's quite like them. Yeah, so do you. Thanks for listening. I hope you've um, found it interesting. Thank you very much.